And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple. Coming to us straight from TPG Games and the creator of the upcoming Archaic Age of Darkness, with a little with a little bit of metal on the side, the one and only Matthew Paletti. How you doing today, man? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say I would say you're. I was gonna I was gonna make a Browns joke, but you're not. But you're but um. That would have been a little bit too easy. Fair enough. I moved to Ohio, so you're more than welcome to do that. <laughs> well, where, where were you from before? Where were you from before that? So I know which team to make fun of. Oh, <laughs> New York. Oh, my sympathies. <laughs> no wonder. No wonder you moved out. I hope to God. You, I hope to God you weren't a Mets fan. Especially, get, especially given that July is com is just is coming close, which means it'll be another year of me making fun of the Mets. You know what? Have at it. <laughs> I haven't it's... gone to a Mets game since I was a kid, and then I switched over to the Yankees. I've been making fun of the Yankees for the longest time because they because they have they have more money than God, and their and their idea is we're just gonna get a team that's good that's good at hanging hitting dingers. <laughs> Which is which is why they're good enough to make the postseason and not get far. Well, you got me there. <laughs> well, when's the? When... It's more. It's more the matter of they they neglect their rotation, and that's that's something you can't skimp on in the postseason. You can hit a crap ton of home runs in a regular season, but that doesn't mean anything. And most teams that do that end up be end up being first round exits. I should know. I have to suffer being a Twins fan. Oh, oh, oh are you now? Mm-hmm. And to be to be fair, I always say I always say that whole my sympathies simply because of the perils of the New York market, and. Well, one well, one of my dear friends is a Knicks fan. Oh my! <laughs> Which is probably the is probably the strongest case for masochism you could ask for. <laughs> Especially when you're owned by a not to not to put too fine a point on it a clown. But I but I digress. That's just that's just the icebreaker. Um, I'd like to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, walk with walk me through your first encounter with role playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Uh, let's see. Probably about I think it was six or seven years ago. Um, some friends of mine uh, wanted to get together and play a uh, Star Wars role-playing game, an RPG. It was uh, Force and Destiny. I don't know if you've ever played it. Um, I have, and I've. Um, if you check, if you look back through the archives, I have reviewed the whole um, the whole Star Wars Genesis um, Trinity. Gotcha. Okay. Um. So I'm I'm more I'm more than familiar with Force and Destiny, and I'm actually glad that it took that, that it took them that long to do Jedi characters, because I always remember what Ralph Costa had to say regarding Jedi and um, Star Wars Galaxies. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't want I don't want to dwell too much on it, but the short version is he was against putting Jedi in that game, and his reasoning was Jedi are an alpha class. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And, um, it it was a lot of fun though. I mean, you, don't get me wrong. Like oh, yeah. it, it, it did not. If you wanted to be a Jedi, you know, it 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 did not move 
maybe as quickly as you wanted to. But it was a lot of fun. I mean, going through everything, how you had to build your lightsaber, it was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, although, the times that I have had people play Jedi, if they're using a lightsaber, I they will be grilled on what their fighting style is. Because... <laughs> I'm a fan of the whole forms of li forms of lightsaber combat that was in the expanded universe, the canon universe, by the way. I don't care what D I don't care what Disney and Lucasfilm say. Okay, gotcha. But and this this is hinted at with some of the talent trees in Force and Destiny, of di of some of them that are dedicated to different um, lightsaber fighting styles. Mm -hmm. The only one that wasn't in there was the set was the seventh form, um, which is which is the form that Mace Windu uses. So I ended up I ended up creating it in there myself. Oh, very nice. <laughs> yes, I think I still have the notes for that some somewhere around here. But give but. That's that's an interesting point of that's an interesting point of entry, but the the vibe that I the vibe that I ended up getting when I looked at um, the Kickstarter for Archaic was a, was high fan was certainly high fantasy maybe even dark fantasy but with a heavy leaning towards the style of fantasy that's seen in a lot of heavy metal. Is that intentional or is that me reading into it too much? I would say it's a little bit of a mix, so there's definitely, you're going to see a little bit of that with some of the characters and some of the character classes. Um, but it, it, it really is an interesting kind of blend. Um, there's some additional races, um, some that are kind of introduced because of the uh, the books that it's going to be based on, mm -hmm. and um, as well and, and as well as like some uh, mythology thrown in, and um, as well as like Christian fiction and, and things like that, because there's two different worlds that are uh, kind of involved with the campaign that comes mm -hmm. out with the game, and. Um, it, it's really just a, a, a big starting point to really introduce people to this multiverse that we're working on here. Um, the I know a lot of people have told me that they're really excited about the, the second game, which, you know, obviously we've got to get the first game done first. Um, <clears throat> but the, the second game, uh, Archaic uh, Race to the Hellgate, is going to be actually... Uh, an interesting position where you're going to be playing as uh, demonic characters who are trying to escape hell. Um, so the first part of the campaign is actually in hell and to escape hell, and then like try and join the main bad in let's just say the regular world on the other end. And the uh, game master is actually going to be playing all the good guys. Mm -hmm. Instead of, you know, typically when you play an RPG, you know, you're, they're responsible for, you know, not just the, the campaign and the journey, but, you know, all your foes, and typically they're the bad guys. But it's kind of going to be a little bit of a flip-flop on that one. Yeah. Now, with that in, with that in mind, mm -hmm. um... I know that I know that you're planning on th on three on multiple playstyles with this with this RPG. Yes. But in order, but I'm guessing I'm guessing that even with that, the core mechanic with all with all of them is going to be is going to be similar. There's still the all roads lead to Rome. Are you going with a D20 based system, or are you doing something different? It's actually going to be something different. All right. Um, granted, there will be you know similar, um, as, as far as like you know the the comp uh, game components. You know, mm -hmm. there's going to be twenty sided dice and everything and polyhedral, um, but there's also, you know, it, it's not going to follow the formula that you you find typically in those games, and 
as you progress from the three modes, we kind of made it like almost like you're playing a video game where you're increasing the level of difficulty. You have a uh, squire mode, which is the most easy. Legendaries, the it's going to feel more like a regular RPG, and then heroes kind of like in between. And it, it also could be used in that regards to help people learn how to play RPG games. But um, as you're at difficulty increases as the campaign will change a little bit there's also going to be different rules including how the dice are used mm -hmm. and what dice are used in that regard would it be analogous to the to these different modes being being akin to um basic and advanced versions yes and um so squire mode is it's like going to be barely an RPG. It's almost like you take a, you, you take a regular tabletop family board game, but then you're making it a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And then Legendary is more like your traditional RPG. Heroes kind of like that blend. And then um, we're going to be doing a core rule book that's going to be coming out, which is actually going to expand upon the, um, the Legendary mode. So that'll be separate from the regular rule book that'll be coming with the game. Mm -hmm. And to but even even with that, am I the the reason why I use the term "all roads lead to Rome" is when mm -hmm. you look at a lot of RPGs, there's always one um, mechanic that a lot of things are going to lean towards whenever whenever some sort of randomizer is needed. Whether that be roll a d20, aim high compared to a target number, or roll or roll a number of die and, com and compare hits and misses, mm -hmm. or dr or draw a or draw a card, or t or take um, beads from a bag, or pull a or pull a Jenga tile. Yeah, that's a thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> what is the per what is the proverbial Rome in your case? Is it d20? Uh, Compared compared to a target number, aim high. Um, <clears throat> part, I I'd say yes. Part of it, part of it is. Um, but uh, part of it's going to be a little bit. Um, I mean, it, it's hard to say because I mean, with any game involving dice. Mm -hmm. especially RPGs, there is a lot of chance <laughs> involved. But it, it, it almost feels like... Um, it almost feels like there's a little bit more uh, luck that's going to be needed in some aspects um, compared to just, um, you know, fire when ready. Um, you need X number of a dice roll uh, per quest. It, it's going to be a little bit more... Um, Gonna be a little bit. It's gonna be a little bit different. There's there's gonna be a little bit more creativity as far as what the game master is gonna be able to employ, and um, there's gonna be a, a little bit of a, a separation towards the end where it's almost like a two part campaign where one of the worlds is one side of the map and the other world is on the other side of the map, mm -hmm. and you kind of have an opportunity. To stop the main bad before they escape to the other world. Um, so you have an opportunity there, but if you fail, um, there is a uh, possibility that you can follow through and then continue a new campaign and track them down on the other side. And then mm -hmm. that's going to... It's going to change some things as well because, um, for, for example, in the original like backstory, for the prototype game book that we came up with, um, one of the first things that we go into mentioning as um, some of the heroes from one world um, are jumping to the other because they're chasing the main bad. Um, we go straight into a couple things as far as they feel different. You know, it's like physics are mm -hmm. different on this other world. So it's going to affect their 
um, you know, their strength, their dexterity, everything, you know, they're, they're gonna, it's almost like they're starting from scratch, even though they've been heroes in their own right already. Um, um, unless if, you know, you're, of course, creating your own character, um, which there's that option as well. Um, and there's going to be some uh, similarities <clears throat> bit and differences between the races of both of these worlds. And um, as soon as they arrive, there's a misconception because of that. And they get attacked by someone who's actually going to be their guide in the campaign. Mm-hmm. But, um, mm-hmm. but I th- I think that kind of, as the, I can get I can get where you're going with when it comes to the campaign part, but um, I think ha- I think maintaining what the what the co- what the core mechanic is whenever some whenever a test is needed is something that should be pre- is something that should be presented. Um, that's that's the reason why I asked that ho- that all roads lead to Rome when it comes to the dice rolling, or mm-hmm. is it a situation where you have separate subsystems for different scenarios? Um, <clears throat> so there's certain <clears throat> some water. There's um depending on what mode you're playing will determine what dice are used, and then of those available dice. It'll then be a subset of like each, each quest on how the um, how the game master is going to play everything out. It's gonna it's gonna be it's gonna vary. It's not going to be the exact same way on each one on each quest in both campaigns. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a little different in each one. And well, let's go let's go into Squire mode. What would be the core mechanic in Squire mode? Sure. Let me pull this up here. And drop down from there. Um, do you want to hear uh, about how the board is set up for it? Or uh, just dive right into the uh, dice? Dive right into the dice, because it, it would be tricky to explain just through voice how the board would be set up. Sure. Not a problem. Okay. Let me go back over here. Uh, Okay, so on the squire mode, there is... Just, uh, there's just going to be two uh, dice that are used and like i said before it, squire mode is going to feel a little bit more like a uh like a board game okay so they the regular players are going to be using a just a regular white marble dice on that one and then there's also a wooden dice which is going to be used on top of that depending on the scenario um it, and how the game master is going to use it in each scenario. So, um, for example, let's say in one of the uh, in one of the quests, you you, you roll the marble, uh, the white dice, and that is going to be as far as how many steps uh, you're going to try and get to the first temple. Okay. Mm-hmm. And um, the game master is going to set up ahead of time the uh, the board. They're going to set up where the temple pieces are, and they're going to establish how many steps is going to take to get to each temple. Mm-hmm. Um, so that part's involved there, and then the um, wooden dice would get used when it's for the battle attacks. So the white dice is going to use both for steps. It's also going to be used for attacking. Um, and it is not on this mode going to be used at all for anything like defense or anything like that. And then the wooden dice is more of like an amplifier. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and then it's gonna, like I said, it's gonna, it's gonna really depend on um, what each, what each scenario is as far as that one is concerned. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. as you, what was that? Oh, go ahead. I thought I didn't know if you. <laughs> it's a it's a timing thing. Oh, look, yeah, gotcha. So then, just as an example. As you move on to uh, hero mode, now it's going to start to feel a little bit more like an RPG. We're going to start introducing some of the 20-sided dice. There is both a uh, green 20-sided dice and a red 20-sided dice. The red will be used by the game master, the green by the players. Mm-hmm. Now, in um, this respect, it's going to be a little bit more different. You're going to involve the... Um, To... Yes, yeah. So you're gonna have the twenty side of the marble and the wood. The wood is going to act as an amplifier. Um, the twenty is gonna be used for attack and defense, and the um, marble is still gonna be used for steps, but it's not gonna be used as far as the attacks. Mm-hmm. And then if we were to uh, switch over to the Legendary mode, we're going to add some uh, metal dice. <clears throat> um, there's some black and white metal dice. And um, there's also, um, I forgot to mention with the Hero mode, there are uh, tiles. Mm-hmm. And the tiles are going to be kind of important. It, it's almost like... Uh, it's almost like playing a trading card game where the tiles are going to represent if you're in an attack or a defensive position. So if you're in a defensive, you cannot, you know, switch to attack and then attack in the same turn. Um, so that'll also continue on to the uh, the legendary. Mm-hmm. And then the, um, the black and the white dice, those metal dice are going to be used by the Game Master not in every scenario, um, but they will be used a couple different ways. Um, you're going to be... Intro- if you play Legendary at the beginning of it, it's going to be introduced as a... Um... as a... Uh, uh, what's the word? Um... As an unforeseen consequence, mm-hmm. you know you uh, you didn't check the room, you uh, you didn't do something, and then it's going to get used later on in different ways. So there is going to be a little bit of variation in that. Then the uh, when the core rulebook comes out, which is going to expand on that legendary mode, we're going to add some more of the um, you know the reg- the other polyhedral dice. You know, in addition to the twenty that people are more familiar with with RPGs, mm-hmm. and then that's going to expand things a little bit more as far as um, what characters are able to do, uh, secondary, um, you know, passive abilities, um, things like that. Mm-hmm. Now, with that in, with that in mind, given the fact that you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, Squire mode almost being board game like. Yes. What in what came to mind for me when you meant when you mentioned that is the old Dragon Strike board game that was intended, even if a bit cheesy, to be a means of teaching people to play A D and D at the time. This was this would have been early eighties. Um, oh, okay. Is is Squire mode going to be leaning into that as a goal as a t- as a a board game that's a means of teaching people to to play an RPG. Um, it is, and it also I wanted it to be not just a learning experience, but granted, I you know I I did, it's not like I played RPG with a family growing up, 
You know, I, I, I didn't have that. But there are plenty of families out there that do. And, you know, just thinking about that and how it would be nice to include the kids who, you know, sometimes they're, they're not always going to be able to catch on to things right away. In a nice way where you could still kind of do that as a family. And like you said, yeah, there is that learning aspect. You, you can kind of learn if you progress. You know, first you do Squire mode, then you do the campaign hero mode, then you do legendary, then you go off the core. And, and you can kind of learn how to play RPGs that way. And that was something that I thought would be good too because I don't know if maybe I should mention this, but like the first time, you know, I was playing, uh, you know, Star Wars Force and Destiny, it was, it was the guys, you know, we were all together, we were drinking. We were playing, and it took me a really long time to catch on to what we were doing. So probably drinking is not the best idea when you're learning. But um, I, I wanted to, to come up with a way that it, it would be a little bit more inclusive. And, yeah, it could be a little bit instructionary, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, taking that taking that into account... Mm-hmm. When it com when it comes to when it com I know that you mentioned a this big campaign idea that you that you're planning. Um and in that regard it remind I'm reminded of things like the Great Pendragon campaign for um Pendragon 5th edition. Even okay. even though you have this grand campaign planned when it comes to archaic are you still presenting it? Are you still going to pre be presenting the wor the worlds of Archaic, so that people could use it to build their own stories and their own campaigns? Yes. Yes, that'll be uh, that will be a possibility, mm -hmm. and kind of um, as the as the the other games come out, the um, the third one is actually going to be a little bit more involved as far as adding additional worlds and there's also going to be other aspects as well like time travel um where that's going to then affect other things as well it's going to affect the landscape the cultures you know all sorts of things and um that was something that i thought of because i wanted to make sure that there was a way that we could make it so people could do their own stories and build off of, you know, whether they're on the first world or the other one, if they're in Terranfold or Earth or wherever it is that they are, and that they can really just kind of craft something of their own as well. And I guess I kind of thought about that because, um, you know, like one of my first, not, not, not the first, but one of my first systems was an N64, and I loved Ocarina of Time. Mm -hmm. And you know, even though you were playing, you know, the same map, it was still just incredibly different. And you had to keep going back and forth with the time travel in order to accomplish different things. And there's going to be an element of that in the third game. Mm -hmm. And with the, with that in with that in mind. When it comes to when it comes to um, the likes of character creation, are you going freeform or are you going with a set a um, a set of archetypes? It's actually going to be a bit of both. Um, the majority, um, uh, majority is probably the wrong word, but there is going to be a, a decent amount of preset archetypes that could be used. Um, but there is also a bit of... Um, even within them, there's there's certain ones like the, um, the Nephilim, which could be used in various ways from, you know, uh, like a Minotaur to a an elemental like there's like a huge range of like different things that we played with and then there is of course uh, a whole section that's just devoted to creating your own character 
Um, there's recommended classes, but you're actually not going to be limited to those classes. There will be um, some basic um, stats and rules to work off of that could help mm -hmm. you in creating that character. Um, and, and there's a lot of things that are just kind of fun that I threw in there as well. So, for example, I'm a bagpiper. Right. So, you know, I, I threw that in there, you know, it just as like a as a, a side little thing, you know, it's not has nothing to do with, you know, like their fighting style. It has nothing to do with, with anything, but there's just like additional character characteristics that you can add on. Mm -hmm. And to that end, to that end. Mm hmm. Given the given the two settings that you have, and this is something that I think is an inevitable question when dealing with fantasy settings. Sure. How do you have magic work? Do you go with Do you go with um a lo with a lower with a lower approach, i.e., uh, magic is dangerous and few people know it? Do you go with it being this subtle thing that everybody is w aware of? Um, where do you fit into that paradigm when it comes to the, the worlds where archaic takes place? So, uh, everyone's aware of it. Um, not, not everyone is for it and not everyone can use it. Um, there's um, going to be some zealots, if you will, who are, are, are very against it. And um, there's going to be a lot of different expressions of, uh, of magic. So, for example, one of the uh, races <clears throat> that I came up with is called a Tolem. And um, there's an interesting aspect where uh, necromancers are very... Uh, dark and and evil and and people you know they, they, uh, most of them they, they hate them and there's a lot of prejudice and everything and unfortunately the necromancers come from the race of tolems but it does not mean that all tolems are necromancers mm -hmm. so there, there, there's going to be a lot of um there's going to be a lot of uh i don't want to say a lot of thinking <laughs> I don't want to make it sound like it's too hard, but there, there's going to be more than just simple black and white answers as far as that's concerned. Um, something I didn't mention before. Um, are you familiar with... Um, they're not really RPGs, but board games where you'll have a, a character card of some kind and then like a, a spinning wheel or two. Yes. Okay, so we are going to have that also, and that is actually for the Squire mode. Then um, the Hero mode, you use that and a character sheet, and then you graduate to a character sheet on Legendary. Mm -hmm. So so part of that's going to uh, play into things as well as far as what you can do and what you can set as far as uh, magic with your character. All right, I, I can certainly get that. Now, with that with that in mind, how are you handling advancement? Are you going with a XP as currency approach, or are you going with something a little more level based? It's gonna be a little bit more level based. Um, you know, it, there, there is an XP um, aspect, but it, it's definitely gonna be level based. Mm -hmm. And. For the record, when I refer to something mm -hmm. as XP as currency, I'm more referring to cases where you get XP and then spend it directly to improve instead of improving upon certain XP thresholds. Right, and that's not how I meant, and I'm I'm, I'm sorry. Um, but I mean, there there is actually experience that will be dealt out by the Game Master, and that is going to affect how fast someone can level up mm -hmm. in the campaign. Now, with that with that in mind, mm -hmm. when it comes, um, 
given given the given the variety of what can be done with an RPG. Yes. Um, do you plan with a bestiary for the GM? Do you plan on having a set bestiary list, or have or are you considering um, options for a G to allow a GM to create their own monsters, for instance? It's probably about. 75 25 you know we're definitely gonna there's a lot of you know monsters and beasts and everything that we're we're putting in there that we're explaining because of the tie-in with the books that'll be coming out next year um but there is going to be room for creativity and we are there's when it's kind of hard to explain without seeing it but there are going to be aspects <clears throat> as the the game master is going through everything, where they're going to be able to pick, except for crucial moments of the campaign, whether they're going to use one of the set archetypes for the monsters or if they're going to be you know using their own. All right, and. Within the, within that, are you when it comes to the GM? Are you planning on giving options to make to make um th even with the three tiers, make it um easier, more difficult to tailor the experience? Yes, yeah, so there's going to be a little bit more um, as they um, <clears throat> progress in the difficulty levels. As it gets more difficult, there's going to be more freedom and more creativity on the uh, side of the game master. They're going to be able to do more things. It's almost like uh, it unlocks those options, if you will. Mm -hmm. Now, with all of with all of that in mind, as I, do you have do you have plans on re on releasing some sort of quick start or doing some sort of demonstration video in the future? Oh yeah. Yeah, that that is definitely a plan. Because mm -hmm. yeah. there's a lot of stuff. I have, um, here you go. There's a lot of stuff that's presented, but um, I think making making it tangible is going to be important. Right. Um, so basically, we have everything set up as far as the illustrator, the uh, manufacturer, and distribution, and um, we're gonna get a. Um, a white label uh, sample mm -hmm. from the manufacturer because we did make some changes. It's not it's not going to look like the prototype that we came up with years ago before we had people game test it. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're going to do is we're going to get that first, and then we're going to shoot the video, and then we're gonna you know we're gonna probably go through. If I can get enough people who'll be excited about it, we might maybe even go through a whole campaign. I was actually thinking about maybe getting the backers involved, you know, and maybe like reaching out and seeing who might be interested from the backers to participate in it, and then maybe, uh, um, you know, put something together. Yeah, I do think one of the important things to step to establish is where is where you lean on what on. But on the dichotomy between board game and tabletop RPG, mm -hmm. like, do you see this as a do you see this as a board game first and an RPG second, or the other way around? I, I see it the other way around. Um, I see it as an RPG first um, because you know, I, I don't think Squire mode when I think about the game. You know, mm -hmm. that's why. I I had the when you asked me about it, I had to pull up the old rule book on my computer real quick just to see what I had written down originally because I could barely remember it. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's just really, uh, like I said before, I, it, it, that, that whole, the board game-ish aspect of that lower mode, the Squire mode, is really just to try and make it a little bit more exclusive and to help get you past that Squire mode so you're hopefully not staying in it. And there is actually, I didn't mention this before, but there is an opportunity every three quests roughly it, it's not going to mathematically come out completely that way um because there's seven on each side 
um, not counting the side quests, but um, the main quest, uh, every three, you have an opportunity that if you want, if everyone's in agreement and they want to, they can level up and transition to that next level. So if they want to switch from Squire mode to Hero mode, for example, they can do that mm-hmm. mid-campaign. And when it came to the concept, you had mentioned wanting it to feel like a video game. Right. What exactly did you mean by that? Because that's something that can be taken a whole lot of ways, especially these days. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing is the uh, different levels of difficulty. You know, I, I think back to, like, you know, Halo games, for example. We have different levels of difficulty or, um, you know, needing that, uh, that ability to free roam a little bit more. It, I'm, I'm probably not even saying that right. Um, I, I, I wanted it to, I wanted it to be an RPG and I wanted it to, um, have that ability to to help people who weren't you know used to playing RPGs, but I also wanted it to be something that kind of felt like maybe it was an RPG that could be taken the way as you would a video game, so that those who maybe were video gamers who didn't like to play tabletop RPGs, you know, they just want to turn the the screen on and and log in and and just get into it that way, but. To maybe make it a little bit more fun, you know. We, we all have. Well, I I don't know if you play online, but you know we. I, I any, any, anyone, yeah, anyone that's a gamer online, you know, has fun, you know. And and whether it's your buddy in real life or people you meet, you know, on Xbox Live or whatever, you know, you you are socializing. Um, it but it also feels a little bit more different, and it is a lot more fun when you have a tabletop RPG when. When you're there, when you're busting on each other, you know, when you're, you know, oh crap, I can't believe I just rolled that, you know, that there's, you know, fun is the best way I can describe that. And, mm-hmm. and I think that's something that you, you kind of miss, you know, um, when you're, when you're just staring at a screen, not that I have anything against video games. I love video games, but, but I think there's a little bit more camaraderie. There's a little bit more, um, Fellowship, if you will, when you're playing together on a tabletop RPG versus a video game. Mm-hmm. Now, given that, given that, mm-hmm. um, you're probably familiar with Appendix N, yes? I say it one more time. Are you cut fam- out? Are you familiar at all with Appendix N? Appendix N. No, I am not. Um. It's short. It's shorthand for the kind, the kind of media, the kind of inspirational media. And given that, given that, just given that being a, being akin to a video game is a very wide net. I mm. would be cur- I would be curious as to what video games you'd you'd say would be analogous to the feel that you're trying to shoot for when you say that you want it to feel like a video game. Okay, sure. Um, <clears throat> probably like Diablo Two, if you've ever played that. Yes, I, I would say along those lines. And that was my favorite PC game when mm-hmm. I was younger. Loved it. Secret Cow level and all. <laughs> um, are you familiar at all with with some of the with some of the mod scene with Diablo Two? The um, with the original or the the remake? No, with the ori- with the original. Okay, because I I haven't done anything with the remake. I'm not I'm not used to it yet. But yeah, yeah, I I remember. I'm I'm not touching the remake specifically because I can't bring my mods over. <laughs> um. Oh oh, you can't. Well, it's well, it's, it's a completely different um infrastructure uh, under the, under the hood, and a lot of the mods that I that I have are for. The older stuff plus um median xl is it is um has wor- has wormed its way in because that because that is a massive amount of extra content for the original okay 
Yeah, I, I, I haven't gotten it yet. I was kind of disappointed with Diablo 3. And I, I think it's great that they kind of remastered Diablo 2. But, I mean, I still have Diablo 2. If I want to get on Diablo 2, I'll just pull it up on my desktop. Oh, well, there's <laughs> also the there's also the fact that going with um going with remakes when it comes to Blizzard is gambling, as everybody learned with the Warcraft Three incident. Yep. Did not play that very long. <laughs> most people, most people, di most people didn't, and. Well, there's a, there's whole videos going into how much of a disaster that was, but but now is a good time to dip into um, ARPGs because there's a lot of high there's a lot of high quality entries these days. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Oh, but given given that given that kind of given that kind of setup, I'm guessing that. With the full with the full on RPG mode that you have planned, um, is equipment going to play a major factor? Um, yeah, not 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 in the Squire mode, but yes, you you get introduced to it in the Hero mode, and then it becomes pretty important in Legendary. Mm -hmm. And. Keep keeping that in mind. What are you shooting for as far as a page count for the full-on book, for the core the, uh, rule book? The core rule book. Um, it's, uh, it's a little difficult to say. I was talking with the manufacturer this past week about it because, depending on, we're we're setting up. You know, it, it's not on the Kickstarter, so my apologies. You wouldn't you wouldn't know this, but I was setting up stretch goals. Mm -hmm. on game found and um part of that involves adding more illustrations so mm -hmm. depending on that that's going to affect the page count but i would say probably between probably between 350 and 450 mm -hmm. I I can see I can see that that's a that's a pretty respectable amount for a core book. Um, yeah. And since you mentioned GameFound, when are you plan when are you planning on relaunching on um, GameFound? Um. So right now everything's all set up. It's under review. So I I right now I'm kind of waiting. Um, to see uh you know that they're verifying everything you know the, the company and everything um to make sure before we can launch and then what i will probably do is if it indeed looks like and at the moment unfortunately it does look like it we're not going to reach our goal on kickstarter launch it immediately as the kickstarter uh campaign ends in about two weeks mm-hmm um, you know, one of the things I put on Kickstarter is that, you know, we're not giving up on this. Um, you know, we think it's going to be a lot of fun. We know the guys who did the, uh, the test plays and everything over the past couple of years liked it. So we, we want to get it out. You know, we're, we, I, we got people who are excited about the sequels. We want to get this going one way or another. So, you know, if Kickstarter doesn't work out, we go to GameFound. We're we're going to find a way to make it happen one way or another. Mm -hmm. And I will be keeping a close eye on how that, how that development takes shape. Um, That'd be great. But with that said, I would like to sincerely thank mm -hmm. you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. You know, I want to thank you because this is a, this has actually been the highlight of my day. I've had a really bad day. <laughs> I didn't mention it before, but I've gotten like no sleep. We had a huge storm. The fence went down. The dogs got loose. It. It's been a crazy, crazy day here. Yeah, I've been ke um, I've been keeping an eye on some on the weather situation across the country, and it's been interesting. <laughs> yeah, so I'm 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 I've been thrilled. It's been great, you know, being on here with you. Um, 
you know, I'll keep you updated as we go, both with Kickstarter and GameFound. And um, if, of course, if you have any questions or any follow-ups or anything, you just let me know, and I'll be glad to get you the information. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I look forward to that. And like I said, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Fair enough. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>